By the end of the 19th century, writers and artists were becoming anxious that the way of life of the countryside, of old England, was being destroyed. This is the heart of Shakespeare country, Stratford-upon-Avon. A local MP, Benjamin Stone, came here and to villages round about to capture traditions he feared were about to vanish, killed off by new urban pleasures. His photographs have a wonderful innocence. It's hard to believe that life was ever like this. If you lived in a little village in the 1890s, no radio, no television, you had to make your own entertainment. And of course, that would often involve folk dancing, folk music, the kind of thing people slightly snigger at today. But Stone realized that with progress, these old habits might well die out. And so he went from village to village, lugging his camera equipment with him, to record the old customs before they disappeared forever. While Benjamin Stone was making a visual record of folk customs, a young composer, George Butterworth, was touring many of the same Midlands landscapes, collecting folk songs and dances for posterity. Butterworth believed that country folk music was the true culture of England, and he wove country tunes into his own lyrical music. An early home movie shows Butterworth dancing a jig in June 1912. My journey's nearly complete. I've reached the Malvern Hills, 20 peaks that rise up dramatically out of the Worcestershire Plain. This was the landscape which inspired Britain's greatest composer of romantic music, Edward Elgar. Elgar was born in 1857 in the village of Broadheath, overlooking the hills, and they would always have a special place in his heart. Elgar saw his music as a tribute to the landscape that he loved. One of his very first compositions, for instance, Caractacus, written about the British chieftain, who according to legend was defeated right up on these hills by the Romans. And that had a libretto written curiously by a great friend of his, a retired civil servant, Harry Ackworth, who happened also to be the secretary of the Malvern Golf Club. Elgar was a passionate golfer. He loved outdoor activities. He thought nothing of cycling 50 miles a day through the Worcestershire lanes. And he loved walking here at Birchwood, where he used to live. And as he played golf or cycled or walked, he conjured up melodies in his head. But Elgar was ambitious. He knew he'd have to go to London if he was to make a name for himself. He found it hard to get work at first, but life at the heart of the greatest empire the world had ever seen soon proved to be a new source of inspiration. In 1901, Elgar wrote a piece of music that would change his life forever, and he knew it. I've got a tune 
He said that we'll knock them flat, knock them flat. A tune like that only comes once in a lifetime. He called it Pomp and Circumstance Number One. But within a year, he'd used the music for that stirring hymn to Britain's imperial power, Land of Hope and Glory. Britain was reaping the benefits of its industrial revolution. As the Victorian era came to an end, there was still a huge popular appetite for celebrating commerce and industry, the engine of empire. Land of hope and glory is Elgar's picture of Britain as a great world power. It's the tune Elgar will always be remembered for. But as time went by, he felt increasingly uneasy about the flag-waving that it seemed to inspire. Towards the end of his life, he realized that what meant most to him was something nearer to home. As a boy, he'd wandered beside the River Severn and listened to the sounds around him the wind in the trees, the bird song, and tried to imagine them as music. He wrote, I'm still at heart the dreamy child who used to be found in the reeds by seven side with a sheet of paper, trying to fix the sounds and longing for something very great. In the end, the picture of Britain that was closest to Elgar's heart was the landscape of his childhood. And perhaps that's something that everyone can understand. One day during his final illness, he was visited by a friend, and Elgar rather feebly whistled to him the theme from one of his most popular works, the cello concerto, and said, if ever you're walking on the Malvern Hills and hear this, it's only me, don't be frightened. Mm -hmm. 